Well, it's after Easter. What do we do now? That's the message today. After Easter, what do we do now? I'm going to ask you to take notes on your phone, on paper. If there's one thing that strikes you, write it down. I doubt everything today will be impressive. <laughs> but if there's one thing that blesses you, write it down. Um, if nothing else, just write the references to the scriptures down so that you can go home and make sure that what's being told to you today is actually found in the Word of God. Amen? Amen. Many churches will not encourage you to take notes or check up on what's being spoken, and that's dangerous. And so I want you to, at least if, uh, if there's a ring of truth to something that you can apply to your life, write it down. Amen? If there's a scripture reference, write it down and then check it out later. Because there will be several scriptures. I don't expect you to be flipping all over the place uh, unless you're super fast. Hallelujah. The message is called, After Easter, What Do We Do Now? Just a couple quick updates. Uh, our pastor, by the grace of God, is doing much better. And uh, we give God the glory and the praise for that. Will you join me in praising God for that? Amen. Come on, church. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Looking forward to having our brother Daniel back home very soon. We praise God for Sister Suzette, who is an excellent wife, a caregiver, and, and uh, first lady of this church. Amen. Praise the Lord. And then uh, uh, this week, you all carried mom and me in your prayers. As I took her to the ER on Tuesday, they ran every possible test you can uh, imagine. And the good news is uh, that there's nothing wrong with her, really. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 I pray that we can all make it to 85 and, 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 and or whatever age God has for us. Amen. Because thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So we're not all on the same path. God has a path for you, and that's why you need to be in the Word, because your path is different than mine. And, um, and uh, it turns out that mom's uh, iron was low, and that's been that way for many, many years. It's just that if we uh, don't keep on top of it, then it'll hit her like a ton of bricks all of a sudden, which is what happened on Tuesday. And so we had her in the ER and came home Friday, and uh, she's noticeably better today. Uh, it's just a matter of time before her strength is uh, is full, and she's right there where she always is. Amen. But our pastor's here in spirit. Our brother Daniel's here in spirit. Mom is here in spirit. Sister Suzette's here in spirit. And John and Phyllis also sent a message that they're here in spirit as they're headed to North Carolina. Will you keep all of these people in prayer and the person next to you and the person behind you Ash, we're so happy that you're here with us today. We love you, brother. So it's after Easter. What do we do now? I'm going to ask you to stay alert. Let me get through this message. Because halfway through or three-quarters of the way through, you might kind of like want to check out. And that's when there might be something helpful for you. So stay with me. And uh, you'll listen fast. I'll speak sort of fast. What do we do now? Do we have to return to the ordinary life? Or can we continue to live in the extraordinary? We tend to say the same thing uh, after Christmas is over. All the decorations are put away. Now what? Well, if you want to keep the spirit of Christmas alive, what do you do? You keep giving. Keep giving all year long as a lifestyle, not just once a year like a tradition. Say amen. Amen. I don't believe Christmas was meant to be a one day a year thing like your birthday or my birthday. The birth of Jesus Christ ought to be celebrated all year long. Say it all year long. All year Amen. Long. So it is with the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Resurrection Sunday. If you want to keep the spirit of Easter alive, share your faith with someone. Tell someone what Jesus means to you and what a difference he has made in your life. Has he made a difference? Anybody but me? Has he made a difference? <clears throat> I know. I know a lot of your testimonies. He has made a difference. The birth, 
death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ are all significant and far beyond what our vocabulary can describe. Our vocabulary limits us when we're trying to describe God Almighty, His amazing birth, the death, and the resurrection. But let's take a moment and observe just a bit of their significance. The birth of Jesus Christ, significant because it fulfilled Old Testament prophecy. Listen to what Isaiah 7, 14 said. This is the Old Testament. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name, what is it? Emmanuel. You know what that means? God with us. That's Old Testament prophecy. So his birth fulfilled prophecy. Praise the Lord. Number two, it provided for us a high priest who left heaven's glory and took on flesh so that he could identify with every sorrow, every heartache, every pain, every struggle, every difficulty, every disappointment that we would ever have to endure. Have you ever endured any of those? He left heaven, took on the form of a man so that he could identify with all of that for you and me. Listen to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. For we do not have a high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He went through everything we went through. But if somebody cut him off in traffic, he didn't sin like we would. <laughs> when, uh, when somebody took advantage of him, he didn't sin like we might, with our thoughts, or with our words, or with our actions. So the birth of Jesus Christ has transforming power, say amen, and gives our life purpose. Somebody say hallelujah. That's the birth of Jesus Christ, very significant. The death of Jesus Christ is significant. Why? Number one, because his death took the chains and the shackles of sin and the sting of death, and the defeat of the grave, and he carried them far away, far away, church, so that we could trade the spirit of fear for the spirit of power, amen, for the spirit of agape love, and for the spirit of a sound mind. Praise the Lord. His death gave you the opportunity to trade in the spirit of fear for a spirit of power and love and a sound mind. That's the significance of the death of Jesus Christ. Number two, by his death, we were granted access into the Holy of Holies. With Jesus Christ as our mediator and our intercessor instead of another high priest who could not identify with the people he represented whenever he went into the temple to make sacrifices. We talked about this already last week, the week before. Caiaphas had no, no clue what the normal person went through on a daily basis. He lived a privileged life above the mundane. He had never had to worry about anything financially or anything like that. He went in to represent people he couldn't even identify with. So the death of Jesus Christ gave us, amen, a new high priest, amen, one who can identify with everything you'll ever go through. Are you thankful for that? Are you thankful for that, church? We're blessed. We're very blessed. Listen to what Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, 15. We just read verse 15. I'm going to read it again. Hebrews 4, I'm going to read 15 and 16, focusing on verse 16. But we do not have a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are, but without sin, verse 16, because of his death, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy, say amen, and find grace, say amen, to help us in our time of need. That's the significance of the death of Jesus Christ. So listen, not only does the birth and the death of Jesus Christ have transforming power to give our life purpose, listen, his resurrection also has transforming power to give our life purpose, his resurrection, church. We're talking about after Easter. Now what? Now what? The resurrection of Jesus Christ is significant, church. 
It's significant. Can I tell you why? Are we together? Number one, the resurrection is significant because by his resurrection, Jesus conquered sin. Amen? Conquered death. Amen? Conquered the grave. Amen? And gave us the opportunity to come out of being a slave to sin, that we might walk in victory and freedom. Thank you, Lord, all the days of our life. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. The resurrection of Jesus is significant because that's what he did for us with sin and death and the grave. He gave us the opportunity to not be a slave to any of those things ever again. Let's talk about God's power for just a moment. Can we? Can we just boast for a moment, brag on God for a minute? Amen? That's what cross life is all about anyway. If I'm going to boast or brag, let it be in the cross of Jesus Christ and not in myself or anything else. Let's just talk about the power of God for a minute. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. You got it? 1 Corinthians 6, verse 12 and verse 14. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 12 says this, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 12. I will not be brought under the power of any. In other words, there are things that we ought not do in this life. They're not good for us. Say amen. You know what I'm talking about. There are certain things that are not good for us, okay? But those things won't necessarily send us to hell. They're just not expedient. They're not going to help us achieve the purpose of God in our life quicker. They're not expedient. But it says, even though they're lawful for me, I will not be brought under the power or control of any of them. Because Jesus said it is finished, he fulfilled the law, which no man could do. That's the power of God. Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have the ability to not be brought under the power or control of any sin. Church, that's powerful. That's significant. That's life-changing. Because of the power of God, because of the resurrection, we have victory. We just sang about it. Do you understand? The power of the resurrection gives you the ability to walk in freedom, to walk in healing, to walk in health, to walk in wholeness, to walk in blessings, to walk in peace. Verse 14 of that same chapter, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 14. Listen to this beautiful verse. God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by his own power. Say, by his own power. By his own power, church. Not only was the resurrection of Jesus Christ accomplished by the power of God, so the victory that we walk in daily is also by the power of God and his Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us not boast or brag in ourselves ever. It is the power of God that allows you to walk in victory. Somebody should shout amen. Every good thing that we are and every good thing that we'll ever accomplish, every good thing that we are, every good thing we'll ever accomplish from your next breath that you're about to take until your next big accomplishment in life and everything in between, all of that happens not by might, say amen, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Zechariah, it's in the Old Testament, Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 6. This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Let me just pause for a minute. I stand up here today, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Chapter 4 and verse 6. Every Sunday, I have to be very careful when I step behind that keyboard because I've played the piano since I was four years old. It's all I've known my whole life. 
And if I'm not careful, I could stand behind that keyboard in my own power and in my own might. But it's not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. It's always by his spirit. We should brag on the Lord and boast about his Holy Spirit. Can you say amen? Amen. Amen. It's been a long week for many of us, right? You've been through a lot this week. You've experienced a lot. Praise God for his spirit that has brought you through. It is not by your might. It is not by your power. Anything you've done, uh, uh, Sister Laurel recently got a promotion at work, amen, by the spirit of God, amen. You're doing well in your workplace by the spirit of God. Always give him the credit. Always give him the glory because it's not by our might. Because in one moment, the Lord could take my ability. I could open my mouth and nothing would come out. If he says the same, it's never by my might or by my power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Amen. Look at 2 Timothy 1.7. This is powerful. We're still bragging on God. We're still talking about his power. 2 Timothy 1.7. For God has not given us the spirit of fear. You know this verse. But of power, amen, and love, amen, and a sound mind. Don't get it twisted. Look up here for just a moment. Those are not three spirits. There's a lot of false doctrine right now talking about the attributes of the Holy Spirit being different spirits. It's one Holy Spirit. Say amen. And he has many attributes. Amen. Amen. 2 Timothy 1.7. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but he's given us the Holy Spirit. And because of that Holy Spirit, there's power and there's love and a sound mind. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Second Timothy. Again, we're bragging on God and his Holy Spirit. Verse 9. Same chapter. Second Timothy 1, verse 9. But the spirit of a sound mind who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling. Are you ready? Not according to our works. Not according to our works. Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. It's always about him. Say amen. amen. It's always about him. I want to read a couple verses from 1 Corinthians. Write it down. Chapter 2. We're still bragging about God. We're still boasting about his power, and then we're going to move on. We're going to wrap it up here. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 2 through 5. This is the word of God, so please don't zone out. Please don't get bored. This is the word of God. Amen. Are you ready? 1 Corinthians 2, 2 through 5. Here we go. For I am determined, Paul says, not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ, meaning except for Jesus Christ. I don't know anything. I don't claim to know anything. I'm only trying to get to know Jesus Christ and him crucified. Verse 3, and I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Verse 4, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. Are we together? but in demonstration of the spirit of power. Hallelujah. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Can you say amen? Are we together? Are we blessed? The power of God. The power of God and his Holy Spirit. Amen. Joshua 1.9, Joshua 1.9, powerful, Old Testament, Joshua 1.9, have I not commanded you? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. I'm going to read that again. I want you to apply that right now to what you're going through what you're going through. Um, 
The verse right before it, Joshua 1.8, says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Next verse, verse 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. Why? For the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. He's with you at your next doctor's appointment. He's with you in the courtroom. He's with you as you pay your bills and there seems to be more month than money. He's with you. He's with you. He's with you. Be not afraid. Be not afraid. He is with you. We serve a powerful and a mighty and an awesome God. And this should be the happiest place in the whole city of Dallas right now in Plano because you're hearing truth. Amen. And God is with us. Amen. And it's by his power that we do anything, anything good, including that next breath that you're about to take. Thank God it comes directly from him. So many people nowadays want to be their own superhero. Superheroes are a big deal right now, right? They take their eyes off of Christ and focus on the power of God that works in them and through them as if it were their own power. Okay? God's blessed us. We can walk in victory. We can walk in power. We can walk in wholeness because of him. Because of him. And when somebody says, I really like your personality, there's something different about you, say thank you because you're acknowledging that person that addressed you. And then be very quick to say, thank God. Thank God because without him, I'm nothing. There was a time, and I'll just add this. This wasn't in my notes. There was a time when I was singing for a really large church for several years. And the compliments got to too many, too many compliments. I was overwhelmed with the compliments every week. Oh, your voice. Oh, your voice. Oh, this. And the way you sang and oh, the high notes and all that. It was very uncomfortable for me. So when I would sing, Sister Faye, as soon as I was done, I'd hit the back door <laughs> and I would go home. <laughs> I didn't want to face anybody. But then, have you ever found yourself really wanting to talk to somebody and just say, that touched me, that helped me, that blessed me, thank you. Have you ever wanted to tell somebody something like that and they were nowhere around? Where are they? I wanted to tell them how blessed I was. So the Holy Spirit ministered to me. These people have something on their heart they want to share with you. But I didn't know how <clears throat> to receive a compliment. Because I didn't want to say thank you and take the credit. But I didn't want to just say, oh, praise God, and seem fake, right? And, and, and not, not appreciative. So the Lord ministered to me, Brother Dale. He said, say thank you. Acknowledge them. And then be quick to say praise God. Thank God. Not only for the gifts and talents he's put in me, but in you. Do you know that you're gifted? Do you know that you have gifts? Do you know that you have talents? He didn't leave you out when he was handing out gifts and talents. He blessed you. He blessed you. He blessed you. You are blessed. You're blessed. You have gifts. Maybe you're not using them. Start using them. But you are not without a gift. You are not without a talent. You are not without the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the creative one. So if you need some creativity in your gifts, ask for it. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you be a little more creative in your gifts. Amen? Whatever he's called you to do, ask the Holy Spirit to help you to be creative. But give him all of the glory and the praise. Can you say amen? Amen. 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 God is good. Let's wrap this up. I want to talk about... Uh, The different events, uh, as I'm wrapping this up, the different events that we celebrate in the life of Christ are really gifts to us. The birth of Jesus Christ was a gift. The death of Jesus Christ was a gift. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ was a gift. They serve as a catalyst 
a push for us to live an extraordinary, extraordinary life. Amen? They're gifts. All these things are gifts to us. So, 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. 1 John is toward the end of the New Testament. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. I'll read it. You'll follow along. 1 John 1, 1 through 4. Don't clock out because uh, the Lord might have something special for you in these last few minutes, and I don't want you to miss it. Amen? 1 John 1, 1 through 4. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life, for the life was manifested, and we have seen it. These are disciples talking about what they've seen and heard with their own eyes and their own ears. Verse 2, for the life was manifested. We've seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. Verse 3, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. We're telling you what we've seen and heard, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. Listen carefully. Look at verse 3 with me, will you? 1 John 1, 3. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you. Why? That ye also may have fellowship with us. Why did he write this? And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Listen carefully. That verse was written because of the fact that the early church was already being plagued with lethargy and heresy. Two big words, lethargy and heresy. You know what it is to be lethargic? Lethargy, lethargic, no energy, no enthusiasm. Are you that way today? If you're that way today, pick yourself up. Don't beat yourself up. Pick yourself up because this is written to second generation Christians. Second generation, way back there, second generation Christians were already starting to be lethargic and heresy was already creeping in. False teaching was already creeping into the church. Heresy was creeping in because people wanted to put their own spin on the gospel, their own twist on the gospel. It wasn't exciting enough. Are you listening? It wasn't exciting enough that Jesus was born and that he died and that he rose again and that he's coming back. That's not exciting enough. I have to put my own twist on that. Marcus, I'm going to need you up here in just a second, my brother. Uh, that's where heresy comes from. People trying to put their own twist on the gospel, their own spin on it, trying to make it more exciting than it already is. Is that possible? Is that possible? I'm going to give you a few examples, church. Write this down. Stay with me. A few examples of what another gospel looks like. Here are a few examples of messages that present another gospel. Listen, stay with me. You're going to go to churches, and you're going to hear another gospel. You're not going to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ being born, buried, uh, uh, dying, being buried, and rose again, and coming back. That's the gospel. You're going to go to other churches, and you're going to hear stuff like this. God wants you to be rich. That's another gospel. I'll show you in just a moment. Here's another gospel. God wants you to prosper. That's another gospel. That has nothing to do with the burial and the resurrection and the birth of Jesus Christ. Say amen. Are we together, church? Amen. Here's another gospel. God wants you to be happy. That's another gospel. 
These are sermons that are being preached, and people are dying and going to hell because the gospel is not being presented. God wants you to be happy. Here's another gospel. God doesn't want you to be sick. Here's another gospel. God doesn't want you to suffer. Let's go back to the first one. I'm going to give you a couple verses on these other gospels. God wants you to be rich. That's a false gospel because there are many ways to be rich other than financially. Say amen. amen. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, hallelujah, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us. Micah, in the Old Testament, Micah 7, verse 18. It says that God delights in mercy. <laughs> he delights in showing you mercy. He delights in mercy. God wants you to be rich. Amen. Be rich in mercy. Be rich in forgiveness. Be rich in love. Be rich in things that matter for eternity. Amen. Second gospel, a false gospel. God wants you to prosper. Okay? Don't get it twisted. That one's twisted. Third John chapter 1, verses 2, 3, and 4. Listen. Third John chapter 1. Verse 2, brethren, I would that you'd prosper. Say prosper. Prosper. And be in good health. Say good health. Good health. Even as your soul prospers. Say even as your soul prospers. God wants you to prosper. You see, it's right there. I wish above all that you'd prosper. That's not the end of the verse. And be in good health. All the while, all the while that your soul is prospering. Laurel, you've got several kids. You have a lot of responsibility. You have to take care of your house, right? Right? And you have to cook, right? Right? And you pay the bills, right? All the while, you're making sure your children are safe, right? All the while. That's what this is saying. I want you to prosper. I want you to be in good health. All the while, your soul is prospering. Let's look at the next verse. It'll tell you how your soul prospers. One of the ways is that you're here today. Your soul is prospering, being in the house of God with fellowship. Say amen. Verse 3. For I rejoiced greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in truth. This is how your soul prospers. Next verse, verse 4. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. As a parent, that's going to be your greatest joy, to find out that your children are walking in truth. As a pastor, the greatest joy is to find out that the church is walking in truth. Amen. This is how your soul prospers, that you walk in truth. So I'm going to take a big stretch here. One of, one of the ways your souls prosper is by being in the house of God because you're not going to hear truth out there. And if your soul's going to prosper by walking in truth, where do you need to be? Church. Amen. In the house of God so that you're walking in truth. Amen. Uh, God wants you to be happy. I'll tell you what. When I stub my toe in the middle of the night, I'm not happy. Okay? God wants you to be happy. This is another gospel. Look at John chapter 15. John 15, 10 and 11. If you keep my commandments and abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, Jesus said, and abide in his love. Amen. Verse 11. These things have I spoken unto you that your joy, that your joy might remain and that your joy might be full. I like it, church, when I find out that you're happy. I like to hear you laugh. I like to know you're happy. But you're not happy laying in a hospital bed 
But I just witnessed four days of a hospital bed where joy remained. Do you hear me? Joy remained. Your joy is far more important than your happiness. Why? Because of the source. Because of the source. Happiness comes from circumstances. I found a $50 bill one Christmas, and I was happy until I spent it. And then the happiness was gone. Happiness comes and goes. I know that when you stub your toe, like I mentioned a minute ago, you're not so happy. But in the midst of all these things, joy remains. Joy comes from God's Holy Spirit, and that's why it remains, because the Holy Spirit remains. Amen? That's why, holy, that's why your joy remains. Here's another one. God doesn't want you to be sick. John 11, verses 3 and 4. Listen carefully. These are, I'm telling you some gospels that you're going to hear as you watch YouTube and TV and listen to other messages. You're going to hear other gospels. God doesn't want you to be sick. In John 11, verse 3 and 4, the story is that Lazarus is sick, and Lazarus is a friend of Jesus. And the sisters of Lazarus send a messenger to Jesus to tell him that his friend that he loves is sick. Are we together? All right. Verse 3. Therefore his sisters sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. Verse 4. When Jesus heard that, he said, this was his response to a sickness of his friend. Quote, ready? This sickness is not unto death. In other words, chill out. He's not going to die. I know he's sick, but he's not, he's not going to die from this. But for the glory of God, for the glory of God, hallelujah is right, brother, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Woo! God has a purpose even in our sickness, and we must not think that we are out of God's will because we are sick or anyone else is out of God's will because they are sick. Somebody should say amen. amen. There's a lot of false doctrine right now that if you're sick, you must be in sin. How about God has a purpose and God has a plan? How about there's a nurse or a doctor that Dale needs to minister to during this time that he's going through this, and that doctor or that nurse would never hear the name of Jesus Christ mentioned unless he were sick and was going to go into that hospital room. Because I'll never see that doctor. I'll never see that nurse. Okay? God has a purpose and a plan. He even said it right here, that I might be glorified. That God might be glorified. So if somebody says, God doesn't want you to be sick, well, it sounds nice. It sounds good. And I don't want to be sick either. But if God has a purpose and a plan, say amen. Then hallelujah anyhow. Amen? Amen. Here's another one, false gospel. God doesn't want you to suffer. Well, I'm just going to give you the passage and tell you what it means. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. It says that if you are going to call yourself a Christian, then you are going to have to identify with the sufferings of Christ. You are going to go through sufferings. So if somebody says God doesn't want you to suffer, that's not what the Word says. The Word says you are going to suffer because you do identify with Jesus Christ. And that's not a very popular thing nowadays. Am I right, church? These are false gospel, false teachings, and they are not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Are you ready? This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there is none other. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Our pastor, Eric, read this passage to us a few months ago. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 8. Here we go. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel 
which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand in it. Verse 2, by which also you are saved by this gospel. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. This is the gospel you believed in, unless, in fact, you truly didn't believe. Verse 3, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I received. Sit up straight, church. Get ready to repeat after me. For this, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died. Say that. According to the scriptures. And that he was buried. Say that. Amen. And that he rose again the third day. Say that. According to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas and then the 12 disciples, and that he was seen of above 500 brethren at one time, of whom the greater part of those uh, remain unto this present day, and some have fallen asleep, some died. After that, he was seen of James and then of the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me. There were plenty of witnesses to his resurrection. Say plenty of witnesses. There were plenty of witnesses to his resurrection. <clears throat> the problem with false teaching, are you ready? The problem with false teaching <clears throat> is that it always comes from false teachers. So it's constantly changing. False teaching comes from false teachers. So it's always changing. The true gospel has always been and always will be, that living he loved me, that dying he saved me, that buried he carried my sin far away, and rising he justified freely forever, and one day he's coming back, oh glorious day. That is the gospel, it always has been, and it always will be. What is the true gospel? Amen. What is the true gospel? What is the true gospel? It's that living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sin far away, rising he justified freely forever. One day he's coming back, glorious day. I said, living he loved me, dying he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming back, glorious day. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming back, glorious day. Come on, church. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming back. Come on, sing the gospel with me. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. And rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming back. Sing it one more time. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming back. Glorious day. Come on, church. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That is the gospel. That is the gospel. That is the gospel, and there is no other. There is no other gospel but that. Have a seat, church. That is the gospel. If you hear anything else other than that, that is not the gospel. It's that living, he loved me. And dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. And then rising, he justified and freed me forever. And then one day he's coming back. Glorious day. <clears throat> That's the gospel. If someone stands up and tries to give you another gospel, don't, don't, don't receive it. Don't receive it. Because all these other gospels that I just presented have a scripture that tell you otherwise. That's why I want you to go home and read what I've told you so that you'll find out that what I've spoken is the word of God. 
If you hear another gospel, take notes, go home, and do your homework, and see if, in fact, it is another gospel. So here's the conclusion. It's Easter. Easter is over. What do we do now? Do we have to return to the ordinary life? Or can we continue to live in the extraordinary? In the extraordinary. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Amen. Will you pray with me, church? Just be silent for a moment. Be still. Know that he is God. That he's powerful. That the birth of his son Jesus was significant. What it meant for us is un, uh, unexplainable. That the death of Jesus Christ was so significant. That the resurrection is so significant. And all of these things, including the return of Jesus Christ, these are the gospel. These are the gospel that give our life power, that give our life purpose, that give our life meaning, and we walk in that extraordinary. We don't have to return to ordinary life because of what Jesus Christ did for us. So, Father, we give you thanks. We thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, and thank you for his obedience that took him all the way to the cross. Hallelujah. We thank you that he didn't stay in that borrowed tomb. But three days later, you spoke and said, Arise, my love. Arise, my love. The grave no longer has a hold on you. Death, where is thy sting? Grave, where is thy victory? Oh, hallelujah. Father, we thank you that because of what Jesus Christ did and because of your gift to us, we walk in victory. We walk in wholeness. We walk in healing. We walk in favor. We walk in blessing. We walk in peace, but not by might, nor by power, but by thy spirit, Lord. By your spirit, all these things are possible. Father, we praise you. We give you glory and honor. So good to be in your house today, Father. Thank you for fellowship because of your Holy Spirit. Pray all these things in the beautiful, healing, powerful name above all names. The name that mentions is mentioned and causes demons to fear and tremble. The name of Jesus. Jesus. Yes, Jesus. 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 What a beautiful name it is. It's in that name we pray. And the whole church shouted, Amen. Amen. The whole church shouted, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord, church. Bless the Lord with me, church. Come on, church. Bless the Lord with me. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Bless you, Lord. Amen.